Awesome. All right. So welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to be kicking off where we left off, not last week, but the week before. And so uh, if you're here last week, I really hope you guys were able to ask Vanessa and TJ all the embarrassing questions about me that you wanted to um, and, and told you about how weird it is to be sponsored by me. Uh, I'm sure they told you about all, all my weird things. And if you missed it, well, keep coming back and <laughs> make sure you ask them about it later. So where we're going to pick up is on page 31 and we're in the chapter more about alcoholism so if you're new to this study welcome we're in step one so it's, it's a perfect time to come and so what we're going to really focus on in the chapter more about alcoholism we're really going to look at the mental obsession and the mental obsession for those that are new for those that maybe haven't heard about that before the mental obsession is that thing that happens when I am as sober as I am today and my illness is untreated. It's that little thought that I have in my mind that tells me this time will be different. Nobody will ever know. I'll just go out for one night. F it, I'm going to kill myself anyway. So why don't I just go to town? You know, all those thoughts that I have sober that takes me back again and again to that first drink or that first drug or whatever brings you to this all-inclusive study. But as we pick up where we left off, we're also going to do a little bit of review of, of the physical allergy. So I won't describe it yet. I'll, I'll let the book do it because sometimes, and by sometimes, regularly, I get ahead of myself. So where we're picking up is a first full paragraph on page 31. We're more about alcoholism. And again, page 31 and first full paragraph. And it says, despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics, are not going to believe that they are in that class. Again, what does it mean to be a real alcoholic? We're going to talk about it a lot more. But lack of control, once I start, and lack of choice. I've said I'm not going to do it, and I do it again. That's what it means. And it says, by every form of self-deception and experimentation. Do you know what self-deception is? I mean, I didn't because I was so good at it. <laughs> but uh, self-deception -de is me lying to myself. Hey, did I ever lie to myself about my alcoholism or my addiction? And then when it says experimentation, listen, I, I don't know about you guys, I don't have a problem. I'm just real scientific, right? If I mix, you know, if I mix, mix this drink with that drink and I take that pill and I get that, you know, I take some crack and I'll get myself up and then drink some more to get myself. I'm just into science is what I'm doing, right? Running those experiments. And so what is self-deception and experimentation? It's a synonym for the mental obsession. That lie that tells me I can drink or use again. That's what we're talking about. And it says they will try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. So we hear the diagnostic criteria, lack of control. Once I start, I, off I go, I can't control it. And lack of choice. When I said I didn't want to do it, man, I do it again. And I'm like, no, no. No, no, I hear what you're saying, Paige, but I am different, right? That's what it means to try to prove the exception to the rule. And I'm sure no one else here relates to that. Like I didn't, I'm sure I'm the only one that came to the rule, uh, the rooms and had a lot of andas and a lot of yeah buts. You know what I mean? Oh, but I'm young and oh, but I've got all, I've got all these other things that are wrong with me and all the ways I'm not like you, right? I'm, I'm the only one. Some of you are like, I'm doing it right now, judging you. Totally fair. Uh, so when it says, if anyone who is showing the inability to control his drinking, and again, when we talk of lack of control, what we're talking about there is that physical allergy. So if I don't have control, I have the allergy. Once I start, I need more. And the more that I drink or the more that I use, the more that I need. If that's my experience, I have a lack of control. So if anyone who is showing that lack of control uh, or inability to control his drinking to do can do the right about thing, that quick turn and drink like a gentleman, our hats are off to him. I want you to know it, guys. I try real hard to drink like a lady. Some of y'all know how little I do and have ever done like a lady. Uh, but like, listen, I am going to drink like a lady. I'm going to smoke crack like a lady. My pinky's up because I'm a lady. You know what I'm saying? I could not do it like a lady. I would actually I often sorry we're going we're going on this lady like tangent it's a little early to go on a tangent but you know how sometimes you go to the rooms and you hear people say play the tape to the end 
And I think that that's a good idea. Now I come to find out as I go through this book that that doesn't work for somebody like me. That's not an effective solution for my problem. But I think, all right, I'm going to play the tape to the end. And I start playing the tape. I start thinking of the consequences. And you know what happens? I imagine myself and I'm sitting on a grand piano and I'm in a red evening, uh, red secret evening gown. You know what I mean? It's glittering. It's sparkling. Never in my life. You know, and I've got those gloves, you know, and I've, there's a chandelier and a candelabra and I've, I've got a glass of the classy stuff, maybe a champagne, maybe a Chardonnay. And I've got that like cigarette holder and ooh, I am smoking like a lit. What's the reality? What's the reality? I'm pissing my pants behind a dumpster. That's what I'm doing. But when I try to play the tape to the end, man, I can't see it. I can't do the right about face and drink like a lady. That's just not my experience. But it says, if anyone is, it says, heaven knows we have tried hard and, uh, it, sorry, it says, if anyone who is showing the inability con to control his drinking can do the right about face and drink like a gentleman, hats are off to them. Go ahead and do it. If you, if you don't have what I have and you're able to drink responsibly or use responsibly, do it. I can't. Heaven knows we have tried hard and long enough to drink like other people. Is that my experience that I tried for years to control and enjoy my drinking? Did I try those experiments? Man, if I'll drink in between glasses or, you know, I'll have somebody take away my keys or all these things that I tried to do to exhibit some control and it didn't work. And now we get into this next paragraph. And you know what a fun fact about this paragraph? It's a full sentence. So sometimes I like this. this by the way, that's a fun fact that's only for the nerds. You know, that's that's only for those of you who guys really brought your highlighters, you know what I mean? That are like, oh, this is my for my fine tip, tip highlighter or my pastels highlighter. But um, for the rest of us, what we're going to see is attempts that I have made to control my drinking. And then we're going to see the progression attempts that I make to exert power over the mental obsession. So attempts that I have made in my life to stop drinking altogether. And we see the progression and we can ask ourselves, is this my experience? So it says, here are some of the methods we try. Drinking beer only. Do we have anyone here that ever tried just drinking beer? We know that Dr. Bob had the beer experiment. It says limiting the number of drinks. Anyone here ever tried to limit the number, right? Never drinking alone. Yeah, we have some people that are like, I'll just keep it up, Pitch. I'll just keep my hand up, right? Never drinking alone. Never drinking in the morning, right? Anyone ever try that? Um, drinking only at home? Now, there, by the way, if you want to know the level of my self-deception, I would come to a paragraph like this and be like, oh, I never did that. And somebody who, uh, you know, had a little bit more of a lens into my life would be like, Paige, that's because you were homeless. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's, that's the lies I would tell myself. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it says never having it in the house, never dur drinking during business hours, drinking only at parties, Squ switching from scotch to brandy, switching from crack to cocaine or cocaine to crack or, you know, switching my substances, whatever brings you to this all-inclusive study. It's not my experience. And it says uh, drinking only natural wine because it's got antioxidants. How can it hurt me? You know what I mean? It, it comes from a plant. Most most mind-altering substances come from plants. You know what I mean? But it comes from a plant. It's natural, I say, as I kiss myself behind a dumpster, like a lady. Um, and so those are, have I done any of those things? Have I tried any of those things to exhibit control, to be able to have some control over my drinking or control over some of the consequences of my drinking, to not end up in those predicaments? And has that not worked? And now we start to uh, see some of the swearing off, the things that I've tried to put between me and that first drink. So it says, um, agreeing to resign if ever drunk on the job. So if I ever show up drunk, I'm gonna quit. Taking a trip, not taking a trip, which I love. I, I had a gentleman, he was, he was on a relapse uh, one time and he reached out to me and he was like, do you wanna go to Mexico? And I was like, absolutely not. You know, just because I, listen, I am easily institutionalized. I do well with routines, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, chance my luck. You know what I'm saying? 
And so, you know, that taking a trip, I'm going to go to Mexico, not taking a trip. I'm not going to go to Mexico because I know I know it's going to be a problem. All those things that I try swearing off. And it says swearing off forever with and without solemn oath. That solemn oath, like I promise with everything in me, I'm never going to do this again. Have I ever sworn off? You know, anytime I come to the rooms of 12 steps, that's an example of me swearing off. Anytime I go to a detox facility, that's me swearing off. Anytime I go to rehab or a, a sober living, that's me swearing off. Have I ever, have I ever had a swearing off? And that not work. And then solemn oath. You know, the craziest thing about solemn oath is when I've said that, you know, like how when you go to court, some of you are like, no, Paige, we're not all criminals. I'm not a criminal. I'm just a bum who didn't get caught as often as I should have. Um, but you know, when you go to court, you'd have to like put your hand on the Bible or swear. Or you put your hand and you just swear that you're going to tell the truth. It's all a most. The craziest thing about that is every single time I said I did not want to do it again, I meant it. I meant it in the depths of who I was. I did not want to do it again. That's the power this thing has. It says, taking more physical exercise. Anyone, anyone go to the gym? Listen, there was a time in my life that I had abs. Genuinely, I had abs. I did not have abstinence, but oh, she was fit. You know what I'm saying? Abs do not promote abstinence if I have this illness. Now, that, for some of you, like you can already tell, this was, this was a long time ago. A long time ago. Anywho. It says reading inspirational books. Did I ever turn to some of those inspirational books or podcasts or influencers? And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do those things. And, man, I, I'm trying, but I can't live up to them. And it's, for some reason, not working. And it says going to health farms and sanitariums. Health farm? Sounds like a rehab. Sounds like a sober living. Sounds like a detox. Sanitarium? Sounds a little like a psych ward. You know, emergency room having a, a mental health stay, you know, one of those uh, government-imposed mental health stays. I'm sure I'm the only one that's been there, you know. In Alberta, we called it formed. I think in California, it's a 5150. So got different names, but still not allowed to leave. And it says we could increase the list ad infinitum. We could continue to add, you know. Yeah, Scott's like, hands up. Who has had voluntary commitment? <laughs> right? Uh, and hold on, because I feel like there's more to that joke. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that you do know they uh, let you leave if they, yeah, they don't let you do things like voluntarily leave. Yeah, yeah, it's it's true. It's kind of like many commitments I've made in my life. You know, I make them and then I got to follow through on them. A little bit of a commitment joke. Any anyway, focus, ad infinitum means like I could continue to add to this list. We can add to the list all the things that we've tried to get so sober and stay sober. Have I tried, you know, just going to meetings? Oh, we're on page 31. We didn't get very far. <laughs> um, still on page 31. Um, and as I could add, you know, uh, just going to meetings, getting into relationships, getting out of relationships, doing the good old geographic, going down to Myrtle Beach because it's going to be warm, but a little rainy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, or, you know, I'm just, I'm going to really focus on the Sens game and, and really get into sports. Uh, you know, all these things, all these things that I try. And is my experience that none of it worked. And if my experience is all the things that I tried to stay sober did not work, it's a good sign that I have the mental obsession. And if I have the physical allergy and if I have the mental obsession, I'm in a situation where I'm in trouble. Because I'm powerless and I'm hopeless. Now, now what we're going to transition into, for those scientifically minded, is our first experiment that you can run. So if you are like, listen, Paige, I don't want to have to listen to you like continuing to natter on. Fair enough. Uh, absolutely reasonable. Um, what we can do is we can run an experiment. So this is the very first experiment that we can run. So it says, we do not like to pronounce any individual's alcoholic. I will point out, it doesn't mean that we're not good at it. It just means we don't like to. So uh, we're not going to tell you you're an alcoholic. We're not going to tell you you have a problem. That's something we have to decide for ourselves. But again, doesn't mean we're not good at it. We can, we can spot each other. Yeah. Um, it says, step over to the nearest bar room 
and try some controlled drinking. Okay, so what does controlled drinking look like? Well, we see that in this next sentence. Try to drink and stop abruptly. So to drink and stop abruptly is to go to the bar and have three drinks and then stop for at minimum a 24 hour period. Because if you are somebody like me, uh, you'll be like, I stopped abruptly when I broke the seal and went to the washroom. You know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll do all the things to like, you know, 24 hours, three drinks and stop for 24 hours. And it says, try it more than once. And so if you're wondering, what are we, what are we testing for? What are we testing to see if we, what we have? What we're testing to see is, do I have the physical allergy? Do I have that thing inside of me that once I start, I need more? And here's my experience. So we go, actually, hold on. It says, it, it will not take long for you to, for you to decide if you are honest with yourself about it. It may be worth a bad case of jitters. It, sorry, for some reason my brain was like, we're done reading. And I'm like, no, 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 we're not. We need to continue reading. It just gave up on putting words in order. So it says, it may be worth a bad case of jitters if you get full knowledge of your condition. And you know, I have, I've gone through this paragraph with, like, I couldn't even tell you how many different alcoholics, how many different uh, addicts, how many different human beings. And I get to this point now, you know, I point out like that is something we can do. We can go out and we can try, not, not we, I'm not, I'm not going to go do that. You can go do that. Uh, but you can go out and you can have three drinks. You can stop abruptly and you can just see whether or not you have the physical allergy. And every single person that I have ever worked with has gone, ha ha ha. I don't need to do that. I know what's going to happen, Paige. That's ridiculous. Right? Because we know. We know that we don't have the ability to control the amount that I take. I mean, I always, I often joke with my sponsees, listen, if you're working with me, you're in a, you're in a bad situation. You're desperate enough to ask somebody like me for help. You know what I mean? We know, we know that we can't drink successfully. And yet, and this is something that is really interesting. Every single person that I've worked with has said, oh no, I don't need to do that. I don't need to run that experiment. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt what will happen, that I will lose control and I will burn my life to the ground. And many of them are not sober. Many of them have continued to go out. And that is the power of the mental obsession. You see, in this moment, I know I can never safely drink or use ever again. But if my illness is not treated with a spiritual awakening, man, I will get that thought that tells me I can. That is the power of this thing. Now, Rob threw something in the chat, uh, and it's about Marty Man, and I'm sure, so I'm just going to read that. Uh, so the Marty Man test. So the chances are 100 to 1. However, against a true alcoholics being either willing, fair enough, uh, or able to undertake the test, the test, select uh, any time at all for instituting it, instituting it. Now it's the best. So Marty Man. And so it says for the next six months, uh, uh, at least decide that you will stick to a certain number of drinks a day. That number, that number to be not less than one and not more than three. And Marty, man, oh, she was a great uh, woman pioneer in Alcoholics Anonymous. I just, I love her. Got a song. And if you're wondering what she looks like, if you look right over Rob's shoulder, that's Marty, man. One of the, yeah, just, oh, man, and I got a fun fact about Marty, man, but that'll take us off on a tangent. So stick around after if you're wanting Marty, man, fun facts, which uh, it's okay if you don't. That's a completely reasonable response. So, yeah. It is, most of us know we don't need to run that experiment. And yet there will be a time and a place where our mind tells us, I can do it. I can drive. I was blowing that whole thing out of proportion. I, I can do it. So that is the power of this illness. So it goes on to say, though there is no way of proving it, we believe that early in our drinking careers, only an alcoholic's going to make a career out of it, right? I mean, for somebody like me, it really was a full-time job. <laughs> But early in our drinking careers, most of us could have stopped drinking. But the difficulty is that few alcoholics have enough desire to stop while there is yet time. 
you know what we're pointing to? Sometimes, uh, sometimes you guys know what it's like to come with the yeah buts. You know, yeah, but I was able to control it when I was young. Yeah, but there were a couple times where I was able to set it down and not drink my way into oblivion. And it's acknowledging that. See, again, the book is meeting us where we're at. There might have been times where you were not out of control. There might have been times where you were not powerless. But the problem is that time is a long time ago and you have crossed that line like and there's no going back. And so now what we're going to get into is uh, one of the things and more about alcoholism. It really gives us a number of examples really lasering in to the mental obsession and what the mental obsession looks like. And it's so it's going to say, um, well, I'm actually so what I'm going to do real quick before we dive into uh, preparing us for the man of 30 and read in the story of the man of 30 is I'm just going to do a really quick review of the cycle of alcoholism. And uh, the reason I'm doing this is because as we go through these stories, what we really, really, really want to see is the mental obsession. That's what we want to see. But it can be helpful to, to look at these stories, these examples through this lens. And so I, I promise I will be quick, although if I'm lying, um, I'll make an amends after. <laughs> so when we look at the cycle, it comes from the doctor's opinion, XXVIII. It comes from men and what, the bottom paragraph where it says men and women drink. And you don't have to turn there. I'm, I'm just going to summarize it. The best place when we're looking at examples from our own life of this cycle is to start with the firm resolution, never again. So at those times where I came to the morning after and I said, that's it, I'm never going to drink or use again. Those times I went to detox, those times I went back to AA or NA or CA or DAA, went back to 12-step or went to a therapist or went to a counselor, or I promised my loved ones I was never going to do it again. And then what happens is we're thrust into that spiritual malady, that restless, irritable discontent. Now, that is not something that is limited to alcoholics or drug addicts. That could be a human experience. But it's important for me to understand that for somebody like me, I don't stop and then get better. I stop and I get worse. I stop and I experience pain. I stop and I experience discomfort. And that fuels that thought that I have, that mental obsession, when I am sober as I am today, that thought that this time will be different, nobody will ever know. I'll, I'll do the Marty Man test successfully this time, so here's how, you know? And then I take that first drink or that first drug or whatever brings you to this study, and off I go. It sets, I get my ease and comfort, my, oh, my relief, my ease, my peace, but it sets off that phenomenon of craving, and I need more. And the more that I drink and the more that I use, the more that I need, I start to drink and I get thirstier and off I go on a spree. And a spree sounds real fun when I'm reading it, not so much fun when I'm near the end of it and possibly in the back of a police car. But that spree is any length of time that I'm drinking or using. It can be a day, a week, a month, a year. And in that time, I burn my life to the ground and I come to fueled with that remorse and regret that guilt and that shame, that self-hatred. And I say, that's it. I'm never going to do it again. And I'm left with me, that spiritual malady. And there's nothing I can put between me and me. And eventually I get a thought. And that thought is the mental obsession, tells me I can drink, tells me it'll be okay. And off I go. And it's important. And so when we go through these, these stories, we're going to look for the examples of this cycle. And how we get off, how we get off the cycle. Because I need to get off of it. I need to get out of it. I take the 12 steps to produce a change, some known as a spiritual awakening. Just how, and if you're new, don't trip out about that. Just the ability to live life sober and contented at the same time. That's all I need to hold on to right now. That mental obsession is removed. So let's go, let's go back to the reading mid paragraph, a completely normal and natural place to go on a tangent as I do. <laughs> and so it says, um, we have heard of a few instances where people who showed definite signs of alcoholism were able to stop for a long period of time because of an overpowering desire to do so. Here is one. And so this is our story known as the man of 30. Now, one of the things I'll just point out, you, you, sometimes you'll hear him reference, ah, man of 30. When I got here, I got here young. So I thought it was a story about an old guy who got sober and then was even older when he drank again. 
And I feel awful about that as somebody who is now well past 30. Uh, also, I have a friend, uh, and actually I have uh, two friends, and they both, they're both they both like, man, we shouldn't call a man a 30. We should call him carpet slipper guy. I've got no horse in that race, but I will say uh, I made him a little sticker that says carpet slipper guy because I like making stickers. So um, feel free to call him carpet slipper guy or man of 30. doesn't matter what you call him. So it says a man of 30 was doing a great deal of spree drinking. So he's drinking, not continuously, but drinking in spurts. He was very nervous in the morning after these bouts and quieted himself with more liquor. And what I wanna point out about the nervousness, there's two things. One, it could be a sign that he's drinking himself in like lots of control, drinking himself into a place where he's having withdrawal symptoms. And that's why he's having that morning after nervousness. The other thing is it is possible that that nervousness is pointing to that spiritual malady, that sense of disconnect, that restless, irritable discontent. But regardless, we're going to see a more definite definition of the allergy here in a second. He was ambitious to succeed in business, but saw that he would get nowhere if he drank it all. Once he started, he had no control whatever. That is the physical allergy. So if you're writing in your book, you can make a little note, physical allergy. Once I start, I don't have control. He made up his mind that until he had been successful in business and had retired, he would not touch another drop. So if I compare my experience with that of the cycle, that would be him swearing off. He's saying that's it. I am never going to drink again, asterisk, until I'm successful in business. That's him swearing off. There's been a couple of times I, I worked with some sponsees that are like, they're swearing off was like, until I'm 80, and then I want to do heroin. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> they didn't stay sober. So that's just, I don't know. I'll just throw that out there as a piece of information. But this is him swearing off. And it says, uh, he made up his mind until he had retired and had, success, had been successful in business. He would and re had retired. He would not touch another drop. An exceptional man. Like, this is an incredible feat. This is exceptional. He remained bone dry for 25 years and had retired at the age of 55 after a successful and happy business career. And so when it talks about him being bone dry, what that very practically means is in that span of 25 years, he did not touch a drop of alcohol. Bone dry, that's what it means. And this is just me throwing some stuff. So feel free to disregard this. But here's what I'll say. It's an interesting use of the word bone dry. You guys ever been to some meetings where there are some people that are like bone dry? You know, you don't have a cigarette next to them because you're worried they're going to go up like kindling. Bone dry. Oh, actually, kind of before the meeting, we were chit-chatting a little about how like emotional sobriety is not a luxury for somebody like me. And after long periods of abstinence, if I'm not actively and continuing to be rigorous in this program of recovery, I can get into a place of hopelessness and, uh, and be suicidal, right? Emotional sobriety is not a luxury for somebody of my type. But bone dry. But he retired. And keep in mind, you can tell that I'm maturing because I'm like, I'm so fun and retired at 55. Good for him. You know what I mean? Before it was like, huh, it's an old guy and an older guy. You know what I mean? I know, I know. You feel free to write inventory on me. I'll help you with the columns. <laughs> All right. And then it says, then he fell victim to a belief. Now, falling victim to a belief. That is going to be a synonym for the mental obsession. So that's what we're talking about there. You can make a little note. The mental obsession. Absolutely. The big lie. That there it is. And here's something that's a little scary. It says, which practically every alcoholic has. Every alcoholic has. This one. That his long period of sobriety and self-discipline has qualified him to drink as other men. Have I ever had that thought? Maybe that period of sobriety was not 25 years. Maybe my three days of sobriety and self-sobriety and self-discipline or three months. But did I have I ever had that thought? That man, this time I I've got this licked. I stayed sober for 
you know, dry January. I, I, I can drink this time or I stayed sober for 60 days. I got it this time. Have I ever had that thought? Practically every alcoholic has. So it says out came his carpet slippers and a bottle. Yeah, after seven years, absolutely. By the way, this is a carpet slipper in the bottle. This is why it's carpet slipper guy for, for those friends. They're really trying to like push the stream of a river, trying to get them being called carpet slipper guy, but I'll, I'll indulge them. <laughs> so in, uh, out came his carpet slippers and a bottle. In two months, he was in a hospital, puzzled and humiliated. And what I wanna point out is when he was drinking, up until, up until 30, he had not been hospitalized for his drinking. And what we're pointing to is the progressive nature of this illness. He did not take a drop for 25 years, and yet the allergy is worse. The consequences are worse. He's now in a hospital after two months of drinking. So again, a sign of the physical allergy. Because if I have the ability to control the amount that I take, I am not drinking myself into a hospital. I don't like those places. I don't want to be there. You know what I mean? Anyone here ever drank themselves into a hospital? Hopefully not just me. Yeah. And it says um, he tried to regulate his drinking for a while. And so he's, uh, you know, trying to exert some control over that physical allergy. He's trying to you know, he's trying to drink only three drinks or drink only on weekends or just try to control it. So making several trips to the hospital meantime, so it's not working. It's not working. Then gathering all his forces, he attempted to stop altogether. That is him swearing off, I'm never going to do it again. And keep in mind, he had some forces. We're going to read about his forces and found he could not. Every means of solving his problem, which money could buy, was at his disposal. Every attempt failed. That's the power of the mental obsession. Anyone here ever go to an expensive rehab? Anyone here ever go to expensive therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists? Anyone here have the love of children and family? You know, not even monetary, but that love and loved others. And that's not enough. Like that is the power of this illness. Though a robust, so healthy, well man at retirement, he went to pieces quickly and was dead within four years. 55 years retired, died before he hit the age of 60, dead. That is the power of this illness. And that is the progressive nature of this illness. And, um, you know, so where, who, so who's this guy, this man at 30? Well, um, if you look over Rob's shoulder, it says, the Common Sense of Drinking. And that was a book written by Richard Peabody. And there's a story that's uh, on page 123 and 124, like real specific for the nerds, if you wanna look at it. But it's not a, an exact fit, like the, the, the dates and the stuff aren't ex an exact fit. So there is some speculation that this man of 30 was, was somebody that uh, Dr. Silkworth um, knew. Uh, just one of Dr. Silkworth's patients, probably in those four years when he was trying to trying to get sober. So that's that's who that is. Oh, and that's the thing. It's like I'll also try to tell you who these guys are, and then you can go look them up if if you're feeling nerdy, uh, which I know I always am. <laughs> so it says this case contains a powerful lesson. Most of us have believed that if we remain sober for a long stretch, we could bear after drink normally. But here's a man who at 55 years found he was just where he left, left off at 30. And you know, there's something not just about the progressive nature with the allergy. This is kind of my experience. And it's my experience, so feel free to disregard it. It's just what's happened to me. I have had my pain tolerance lessened. I can't get away with the stuff that I used to get away with. You know, you remember those days where you could just nurse a real good resentment? Oh, oh, yes. Oh, they're wrong. And here's how. Man, I can't live that way anymore. And so what, I, what, I'm, what I'm talking about or what I'm pointing to is my recovery has also had to become progressive. I, I, and it's, by the way, if you're new and you're like, that sounds awful, Paige. What do you mean? I've got to continue to grow spiritually and grow in this program? Blah. Fair. Fair. That would have been me too. But what I've found is I get to. 
I get to grow spiritually. I get to grow in this program. And man, I, the, the gift of not having a high pain tolerance, the gift of having to turn to inventory. Some of you are like, that doesn't sound like a gift. The gift of having to make amends, the gift of growing in these daily actions, the gift of working with others. It is a gift. I got I to gotta do it to experience that, though. You're not going to believe me based on my words, but prove me wrong. That's, that's me trying to use some reverse psychology. It's called being manipulative. Oh, okay. Welcome. Glad you're here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, focus. All righty. So it says, we have seen the truth demonstrated, and we talk about demonstrated, this is what we have seen based on experience again and again and again. So again and again, I added an extra again out of emphasis. <laughs> and it says, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Commencing to drink after a period of sobriety, we are in short time as bad as ever. We quickly get as bad as we were before. Is that my experience? We can hold our experience up to this book. Is that my experience? And like, is my experience that every time I said I'm never going to drink again, and then I go and I have a period of sobriety, I go out and I end up as where I left off, if not worse. Is that my experience? And it says, if we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any kind nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. And what we're talking about here, reservations, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not booking our spot at a restaurant. That's not what we're talking about. And what I found is there's different types of reservations. The first type of reservations is reservations that I can drink safely. Reservations like I want to have a glass of wine on my wedding day. Or maybe a reservation like I want to do black tar heroin when I'm 80. You know, reservations like that. Those are reservations. But I, I want to, I'll do this thing for five years, but then I want to drink like a lady. You know, so that's one type of reservation. There's another type of reservation. And that reservation is if this thing happens to me, I don't know if I can stay sober. That's another type of reservation. And I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I came in, I, I had I had some of those reservations. Maybe I shouldn't finish this thought, but I'm going to. A lot of them have happened. Here I am. <laughs> Sorry, some of you are like, this is not the message of hope that I was hoping for. Uh, but yeah, I, I've had some, oh man, I have had some stuff happen in sobriety. Thank goodness my sobriety isn't contingent on anything outside of myself. And so, and then there's a third type of reservation that I've found, or a third type of reservation that I've experienced. It's a reservation about the program itself. I don't want to make that amends. I don't want to share that secret in my fifth step. I don't, I don't want to meditate. I don't want to, I don't want to work with, you know, other alcoholics or if I'm, you know, an addict, I don't want to work with other addicts. They're so unreasonable, you know, just like me. Uh, those sorts of reservations, or I don't want to do all of this, right? And so this is a point in the book where I, when I work with my sponsees, I always stop and I always ask, do you have any reservations? And then they lie. <laughs> like I did. No, I've got no reservations. You know what I mean? Um, but if if they, and I, so I, I say this too, what do I do? What do I do if I have reservations? What if I, what do I do if I have fear about the program? What do I do if I, if I'm afraid if this happens? Well, if some of my reservations are fear-based. We can take them through the fear columns when we get there and it won't take us long to get there. But ultimately what I can do is I can pray. I can ask for the reservation to be removed. Take this from me. And so that's something that's something that I'll offer. If you have a reservation, that's an action that you can take. And it says, young people, that used to be me. I mean, I know it's still me, but like I got here in my early 20s, so I mean, it was really me. Young people may be encouraged by this man's experience to think that they can stop as he did on their own willpower. Again, the book is meeting us where we're at, because like how many of us would read that and be like, I can do it. I, I'll just be the man of 30. I'm just going to have a successful, happy business career. I'm going to work real hard and focus on work. Anyone here ever focus real hard on work? And how did that turn out? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, not great, not great. Turned out drunk again, right? <laughs> and so the book, Meeting Us, Where We're At. And it says, we doubt if many of them can do it because none will really want to stop. 
and hardly one of them because of the peculiar mental twist already acquired will find he can win out. That peculiar mental twist is that mental obsession. The thought that I have when I'm as sober as I am today, this time I can drink. This time it'll be different. I'm going to kill myself anyway, so why don't I get drunk? I got to pay, I got to get it out of my system. I'm going to do it anyway. So what's the point? That, that is the peculiar mental twist. So it says several of our crowd, men of 30 or less had been drinking only a few years, but they found themselves as helpless. That's another word for hopeless. So for those that have been coming, you know, we're, we're emphasizing hopeless, 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 helpless, pretty similar to hopeless. Uh, helpless is those who have been drinking 20 years. See, what alcoholism is not about is the length of years that I've been drinking. It's not necessarily about the quantity that I've been drinking. See, I got sober young and there were some, there were some people who were, uh, had been sober a long time and uh, they thought it would be funny to share the, uh, you know, oh, I spilt more on my tie than you ever drank. So if you're looking for an unspiritual response to that, um, keep in mind, you might have to make an amends, uh, but I'll just, I'll give you an unspiritual response if you're looking for one. Why would you be? This is not helpful. Anywho, it is, if you, if you stop spilling so much, you might've gotten here sooner. That was my not spiritual retort. And so it doesn't matter my age. And, and I, I really mean that, like being sober young, or getting sober young. I had young people in my life, still have young people in my life. Um, and I, man, I got, you know, I go to funerals. I'm, I'm somebody that goes to funerals and I've got funeral cards over the last 14 years of, of my sobriety from people more than I, like in my lifetime, I've gone to something like over 50 funerals, many of them. I won't say all of them. I didn't do number, numbers, but most of them or many of them under the age of 30. It does not, it does not matter how long I've been drinking. If I got lack of control and lack of choice, I have this illness. And if I have lack of control, and lack of choice, I am in trouble. And it says to be gravely affected. That's what we're talking about. Gravely affected means for this to be fatal, dead. One does not necessarily have to drink a long time, nor take the quantity some of us have. This is an example of me getting ahead of myself. See, if I just shut up and read, we would have talked about it. But I just, my brain gets going and off we go. Uh, so it says, this is particularly true of women. Oh, that's me. <laughs> so it says, uh, potential female alcoholics. Now, anytime I referred to potential female or potential alcoholic, that was the only time in my life I thought I had potential. I'm like, oh, no. But potential female alcoholics often turn into the real thing and are gone beyond recall in a few years. Man, I, that was kind of my experience. It didn't take my, me long to, have, to get to a place where my life was absolutely unrecognizable and the consequences of my alcoholism were horrific. It did not take me long. And there's two ways to look at the word recall. Uh, and I'm, how I'm pronouncing it is kind of looking at both. So gone beyond recall, like it's like who you are is absolutely unrecognizable. But another way to look at recall is to be brought back, you know, gone beyond that line of where human power can bring me back. And I, was, I was talking with the sponsor about that literally just the other day, and, and that was something we were talking about. And it says certain drinkers who would be greatly insulted if called alcoholics are astonished at their inability to stop. Right, that mental obsession. We who are familiar with the symptoms, what are the symptoms? Lack of control, lack of choice, mental obsession, physical allergy. We who are familiar with the symptoms see large numbers of potential alcoholics among young people everywhere. But try to get them to see it. We're not open when we're not open. You know, if I still got, if I don't have a lot of consequences, if I don't got a lot of pain, if I still got my good ideas, man, yeah. I'll listen to this page and that on out of this book from the 1930s. I sure as heck don't want to do an inventory. That sounds like a lot of work. You know what I'm saying? Now, that now what we're going to transition into is our second experiment. So for those of you that are here for the science, this is science 2.0. We're going to be doing more science. <laughs> so it says, uh, as we look back, we feel we had gone on drinking many years beyond the point 
where we could quit on our own willpower. So what we're going to see about testing is we're going to be able to see about testing, do I have the mental obsession? So we're testing, do I have the physical allergy? Now let's test, do I have this mental obsession? So if I have the mental obsession, I can't quit on my own willpower. If I've got the mental obsession, or if I don't have the mental obsession, oh, my willpower is fine. But if I got this, it's not going to work. So it says, if anyone questions whether he has entered this dangerous area, let him try leaving liquor alone for a year. Just don't drink for a year. Just don't drink for a year. How's that sound? I mean, some of us are already like, oh, that's, I mean, you can put some names if you want, you can go to the gym if you want, just don't drink for a year. And so, if he is a real alcoholic, and very far advanced. There is scant chance of success. Like, man, if I, if I got this thing, it's not likely. I'm staying dry for a year. Now, keep in mind, when I offer this solution to sponsees, I mean, keep in mind, if they're working with me, they're super desperate. Um, but when I'm working with sponsees, you know, I'm like, here's what you can do. You don't have to work with me. You don't got to, you know, do any highlighting. You don't got to do inv any inventory. I won't even put you in an amends off or nothing like that. Some of my sponsors are like, oh God, no. Uh, but uh, I won't even do any of that. You can just don't drink. Just don't drink. And they know, man, they're like, no, I know that doesn't work. I know I can't do that. I tried that. Why wouldn't I try that first? You know, the room, the 12 step or the last place I come and the last thing I try in the rooms of 12 step the 12 steps. I want to try everything else first. You know what I mean? We don't have to, by the way, if you have it, you don't have to you can grab a hold. But then what's another insane thing that I will do? I will ease away from the program and stop taking the actions that I need to take. I will start backing away. So even though in this moment, I know I can't stay dry anything like a year. If I do not treat my illness, I will get a thought that says, ah, I don't gotta, I don't gotta show up on Mondays and listen to Paige. I don't gotta do that inventory. I don't gotta pray. I don't gotta meditate. I don't, I don't gotta work with others. And it's a backing away until the insane thought tells, tells somebody like me, I can drink again, or I can use again, or I can pick up that addictive or compulsive behavior, whatever brings you to this study. And it says in the early days of our drinking, we occasionally remain sober for a year or more becoming serious, serious drinkers again later. So even if I've had a period of, of long sobriety, that does not mean I'm, I'm okay. That does not mean I'm cured. That doesn't mean I have this illness. And it says, though you may be able to stop for a considerable period, you may yet be a potential alcoholic. We think few to, few to whom this book will appeal can stay dry anything like a year. What it's saying is like, girl, if you're zooming into this big book study, you're probably not able to stay dry anything like a year. If you're so desperate, you're trying to read this book from the 1930s, that's probably not you. But I also remember, um, I did a big book study with somebody else for, for many, many years, and we would meet in person. And there was this gentleman, and I just, um, I just loved him. He was just such, like, he had this biggest, warmest belly laugh. And he was so thoughtful and considerate. And after the study, he would always come up and shake my hand and say, thank you for, thank you, which, which just meant the world to me. And he shared, and we were at that study that we did together, we, we would often, some of you guys are like, oh, I know. Uh, yeah. We would often do examples of, of, from our own lives of the cycle on the, because we were in person, we'd have a whiteboard and, you know, it wasn't on Zoom, so we weren't recording it. And we would, you know, have those examples. And he shared this example, this warm, wonderful man uh, with this warm laugh about how he stayed dry a year. And it was like agony for him. And he was miserable. And he tells, he, you know, he tells the story and he tells about, you know, how he's just angry at work and miserable at work. And, it, you know, after a year, he wasn't doing AA or any other 12-step meeting. He was just not drinking. They had this day at work and, you know, he lost his temper and he was like, ah, F this. And he goes and he Go got, he went and got drunk. And, and that was his example of the cycle. Now, and he shared that at the study and, and he, he came and he was a wonderful man. And, and so this, this story is going to get a little serious. So I'm just giving everyone a little bit of a heads up. He would come to the study and come to the study, but he drifted away and he inevitably drank again. 
and in one of his and in his relapse, he murdered his girlfriend through a domestic violence incident. And when I come to this point of the book, it is just the stark reality of what an alcoholic death can look like. You know what I mean? And like I, you guys know, I love to have fun with this stuff, but that is the deadly seriousness of this illness. That is a man, and that genuinely, I, I care about that man who I would have never pegged to do something like that. We become somebody we never wanted to become. We do things we never wanted to do, and we hurt people in ways we never want to hurt people. And that, that is why I need to grab a hold of this thing. You know, and, and keep in mind the other the other side of it, man, I, I'll, my illness, it'll keep me in situations that are not safe, that are not good for me, and put me in a position where I'm on the other end of that. I'm sure no one else relates to being in a codependent abusive relationship. You know what I mean? And so the hope is that we're going to, it's not a great, uh, uh, hold on, I'll finish the paragraph and then we'll wrap up. Um, but the hope is that we grab a hold of this thing, because as dark as this illness is, is as bright as the solution. You know what I mean? The, the darkness and the despair and the depravity that comes with our illness, man, the solution and offer is filled with hope and joy and a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful than anything I could have imagined. So let me finish the paragraph and we'll wrap it up there. It says, some will be drunk the day after making their resolutions. Anyone here said, I'm never going to drink again and been drunk the next day? Or, or started our day, I'm never going to do it again, and start, I went to work sick and hung over, and then by lunchtime, we're starting to think about how we could take a drink or two, and the end of the day, we're drinking again. Does that sound familiar? And it says most of them within a few weeks. Has that been my experience as well? So we'll leave it there, and uh, we'll pick it up next week, where we kind of get into some non-spiritual ways to quit drinking, and we'll hear the story of Ralph, or not Ralph, well, it is Ralph, but the story of Jim, <laughs> yeah, and then uh, we'll we'll talk about uh, maybe if I'm good on time, and I'm not usually good on time, we might even make it to the jaywalker and friends, so we'll, I'll stop the recording, and we can then wrap up with a prayer, so thank you guys.